Yeah, sorry, I hadn't realized you are um, live streaming it. Yes, all yours. Um, namaste. Namaste. Uh, we're very happy to be here today with um, Eddie Billy Moria. He uh, will be discussing some points with us from Idols of the Mind versus True Reality uh, by Bhakti Madhavapuri, uh, chapter two, which is the same name of, as the book, actually. Um, so, um, Mr. Bilimoria, would you mind introducing yourself? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Krishna, if may, I may call you Krishna. Sure, sure. It's a great privilege to be invited, and especially so on a topic that is so um, meaningful to us and so important, if I may put it that way, to um, the, the the understanding of science and the humanities for mankind in general. So very briefly, my background is uh, uh, I'm a consultant engineer. I worked in a whole variety of industries, the oil and gas, the petrochemical, transport, aerospace and defense. And um, people often ask me, uh, well, how do you marry this whole subject of science and Eastern philosophy and esoteric philosophy with science. And uh, my simple answer is everything is an emanation from the divine source. So science is an exploration of the laws of nature on the physical plane. But uh, there are also higher laws of nature. And I, I studied uh, in London at Imperial College, uh, Sussex University, and then I did cultural studies in, in Oxford. But uh, one thing I will say is that my background is Eastern, but I was manufactured in the West, which means that I'm completely happy in the East or in the West. So I think it's a great privilege to have my raw material from the east but my assembly and the manufacturing in the west so i'm marrying both worlds and just one more thing about myself i have a lifelong passion for music you see my piano behind me and i try and practice still two hours every single day so music and the arts is as important to me as science because all of it is an expression of different aspects of the divine nature. Yes, definitely. Um, in the teachings of GWF Hegel, um, which our institute draws from often, mm. uh, he, he uh, taught that the beauty which art seeks is the same truth which science and philosophy seek and the same love that is what religion seeks. So these are all uh, the dynamic facets of the absolute and from these various uh, disciplines of art, religion, philosophy, or science, they're all um, approaching the same goal, uh, although from different perspectives and through different paths. Um, and I also just wanted to, uh, before we go deeper into this you also have um, a specialty that you recommend uh, that you had mentioned in your email right um, about um, Sir Isaac Newton who's a very uh, prominent figure obviously in modern science and um, he's oh, had, we're gosh, mentioning yeah. him in this chapter often so uh, since he'll be brought up I'd just like to mention uh, your work mm -hmm. on, on Sir Isaac Newton and maybe you can speak to that. Yes certainly just your first point what Hegel said is so true and again Krishna you find that the greatest minds are all in resonance and my wonderful aunt in Bombay I'll never forget <laughs> her um, the way she put it that all the sages and all great minds have dipped their pen into the same inkwell of wisdom and eternal truth but they've written with their individual handwriting obviously, which means that the ancient wisdom, and ancient means eternal, of course, perennial, the wisdom is one, it's the same ink, but it has to be phrased and stated in an idiom suitable 
to the times we live in. So Hegel has superbly stated the essence of what the ancient teachings in the East and West have always promulgated and alluded to, that the divine nature is a beautiful diamond and science, religion, philosophy, art are all the shining faces and facets of that one diamond. And I should say that I've been strongly connected with the um, Theosophical Society for nearly half a century. And one of their main goals was to show that science, religion, philosophy are streams that have come from the one source. And this is something that Isaac Newton wrote so eloquently. And it is, I would use, almost use the word, it is a crime. It is a crime that science refuses to acknowledge that Newton's entire work was a homage to divinity. As he openly stated himself, now, why this has been uh, so well, because of the extreme materialism of the age we live in. Th this hideous idea of the clockwork mechanical universe was something that post Newtonian scholars took on board because of the precision and quantitative beauty of the mathematics. <laughs> they said, oh, well, the universe is a clock. In Principia, if people would bother to read Principia, and with the greatest respect, Stephen Hawking included, in the very first few pages of Principia, Newton states his rules <clears throat> and says, I'm slightly paraphrasing, that let the reader beware that when I use words, force, and impulse, I use these terms promiscuously only in the mathematical sense, with no relation to real physical effects. So Newton's Principia was a mathematical depiction of the workings of the universe. So if I give you, sorry to extend this a bit because it's so important, if I give you, oh gosh, wait a minute. <clears throat> Here is an example <clears throat> of a parabola, okay? Now we can describe the equation of the curve. The simplest equation is y squared equals 4ax. So, or you can say it's a quadratic, let's make it simple, y equals x squared. So when x is one, y is one, when x is two, two times two is four. Now that describes the shape of this curve. It's a mathematical depiction. It is an, an idol, so to speak. It, the equation does not describe the color. It does not describe the texture. And it does not describe the taste if you care to eat it. So Newton's Principia was a mathematical depiction of the movement of the planets and cosmos. It had no relation to mechanical and physical effects that the later Newtonian so-called scholars have degraded it down to a so-called clockwork universe. And in his correspondence with Richard Bentley, Newton wrote four letters in proof of a divinity. When Newton uses the word proof, he means proof. And um, <clears throat> in his wonderful book on optics, and optics is not a book that you have to go um, hunting around uh, in archives. Optics is the great book on light, 
And Newton says, does it not appear from phenomena, phenomena, that there is a God impersonal and eternal? Phenomena are the outbreathing of the noumena, which are the invisible causes. Now, Newton's uh, great religious work is slowly receiving recognition only in academic circles. So uh, um, it's my, my little life mission, if I can put it without something presumptuous, to show that not only Newton, but all great scientists have acknowledged divinity. And I distinguish heavily great from famous. The famous are not great. Very few famous scientists are great. There are few exceptions. From, from our perspective, we are giving all credit to Newton for recognizing the necessity of what he said, Lord God, <laughs> Panto Creator, right? In the yep, general yeah. Sholium. That's right. And it was a matter of necessity for him because yeah. he he knew the statistical um, improbability of the stability of the solar system if it was purely based on chance, which yeah. is what materialistic science claims, mechanical yeah. perspectives yeah. claim. So he, yeah. he could understand the necessity that uh, mm -hmm. there had to be some intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. Because long-term consistent activity Mm. is the mark of intelligence otherwise chaos yes. uh, just unintelligent unorganized activity that is that is the the um you know product of un no intelligence so some mm. intelligence had to be there and, and he recognized the necessity of that and so this is mentioned both in chapter two and chapter three um, mm. of this book idols of the mind versus true reality yeah um but, so but in chapter two um, Maharaj in the beginning starts the book by just first pointing out the difference, as you've also mentioned already, uh, between the noumena and the phenomena, mm. where uh, this was first, I think, explicitly described by um, Immanuel Kant, mm. who recognized that what we are seeing with the senses, that is the appearance of a reality, yeah. Yeah. which uh, for Kant was unknowable, the thing in itself was unknowable to consciousness, but he recognized the necessity of its existence through the mm -hmm. phenomenon. Now, this is where Hegel came to actually uh, expand and dive deeper into these ideas where for Hegel, the thing in itself was not unknowable because what was appearing was an mm -hmm. aspect of that noumenal reality. Yeah. So the phenomena is not just uh, somehow separate from the noumena. It is no, an aspect no. of it. It's an aspect it, it, of it. It is of the same essence, but at a much lower level, because yes. it's only a fragment, so to speak. Well, it's our finite, uh, our finite consciousness as yeah. as limited entities. We yeah. our finite our senses, senses yes. can only appreciate that which belongs to the senses. So if your if your senses function just on one level, on the physical level, then what you will appreciate and what you will see is purely limited to that field. Yeah, so, so, I mean, there are different levels of consciousness as explained in Hegel's phenomenology yeah. where in the, in the first most immediate, he starts with the most immediate or unmediated and then develops onto the most mediated or mm. developed. Mm through a necessary movement where each stage, the preceding stage necessarily results to, the, to a higher stage of consciousness. Yes. And it's all, the, the whole development of consciousness is all described as the subject-object relationship because that's you know, a very uh, straightforward, sober assessment of what consciousness is. There are three elements. There is a subject, the object, and the subject-object relation. And the relationship. It's the Trinity <laughs> in so in religious terms, if you like. Yes, I mean, well, it's definitely there's a, a tripartite aspect to it. Um, and 
so this the movement from the most immediate to the mediated is essentially what is the scope of the book idols of the mind versus true reality when we just start with the immediate mm. when we start with just sense perception or even very fundamental very bare and undeveloped forms of consciousness such as uh, what's called the verstand in german or the understanding which only perceives the differences among things but cannot yeah. perceive their unity mm. and these are and then from that we become stuck between just these sense perceptions and this very bare understanding yeah. and we take that to be everything this is what produces reductionism this is what produces all these theories and models that are taken as the actual and thing not only that krishna it's what produces all the animosity and all the acrimony sure yeah, because um, idols of the mind is a graphic and strong way of putting it uh, and a very um, gripping uh, metaphor because they are indeed idols. And an idol it does have a relation between what the idol looks like and, and the reality, but it's not the reality. So I think the... The best one, there's no such thing as best. One way of looking at idols is mental maps, conceptual maps. And H.P. Uh, Blavatsky, the, the great found, uh, principal founder of the Theosophic Society, in her incredible, beautiful book, The Voice of the Silence, she has this seminal passage The mind is the slayer of the rail, let the disciple slay the slayer. In other words, the mind creates these idols and we have to slay, to cut out these idols, to reach an understanding of where these idols have come from. So putting it slightly differently, there is so much talk on thought. Far more important is who produces the thought, the thought producer is the important point to focus on, not the productions. Ramana Maharshi, his constant advice was to trace thought to its origin. All of these great people are saying the same thing and pointing to the same wisdom in their own way. So science being an interpretation of the world, and by science I always mean mainstream physical science. I don't mean science with a capital S, of course. Mainstream physical science is dealing with interpretations and therefore with idols. So they are dealing with the refractions, the various refracted beams of truth without realizing that all of these beams have come from one source. Hegel, what he presents and he recommends is that we can't isolate any part of the dynamic whole. So, when we talk of thought, thinker, and that which is thought about, this tripartite aspect you mentioned, none of them can be isolated from the rest and considered in that isolation. Of course not. Because then it abstracts from the whole. Of course so, not. Yeah. Like when we look at Aristotle, what did Aristotle define theos, God, as? He, he defined theos as noesis, noesios, noesis, thought, thinking, mm. thought. Mm. So this fundamental uh, activity, which is necessarily and irreducibly dynamic, it's mm. both, it's not just a unity, but it's simultaneously a diversity. It's a unity it in is, diversity. Yes, yes. It is um, unity in diversity, in diversity subsumed in unity. So you've used the 
very appropriate term dynamic, meaning it is a process, yes. it's not an object. And the, the great confusion uh, in, in, uh, in a lot of science is conflating, fusing together the producer from the production and also confusing the objective with the phenomena. For example, here is my mouse. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, here we are. You can put that in a box. You can't put a rainbow in a box because a rainbow is not an object. It's a phenomena. It's the phenomena of the laws of refraction and the physiological process. You can touch this. You can touch an object. You can't touch a rainbow. If you went up in a hydrogen balloon, you wouldn't be touching the rainbow, you'd be touching water droplets. So a phenomena and an object is something that is not clear in a lot of scientific thinking in my consideration. And also in neurology, in neuroscience, there is this huge confusion between the instrument and the performer. The instrument being the brain, of course, and the performer is the, um, the, the mind that works through the brain, as the great William James pointed out, not using the brain, but through the brain. That's this. So, of course, the classical uh discussion in philosophy right what is fundamental thought or being very often is this comparison thought or being either or this again this is more characteristic of the yeah. understanding where it's only seeing the differences and it can't see the dynamic exactly. unity with the unity indifference so reality is simultaneously thought and being thinking being exactly so where and the language gets in the way and it's just a matter of um how how we can develop or or uncondition ourselves like we are here sitting in front of computers mm. we had this conversation uh, i think with our group our group discussion that we had during this chapter um mm. so this computer most people would call it a thing it would be in the realm of things of objects they wouldn't consider this computer in front of me an idea Mm. It wouldn't be a thought. But so what is a computer? A computer is something which arose from some necessity. There was some necessity to compute things in an efficient way. Mm. And that was an idea. The idea, this necessity spawned the idea for some uh, way to fulfill that need. So this is all happening within the realm of thought. And then through the continued mediation of thought maybe it was uh, unmanifest in the beginning or it was in the realm of potentiality it wasn't fully manifested yet and now here we are and the, the thought is now in front of us it's no less a thought this hard it's, it thing, is still a thought still a thought extremely well put um in engineering if i can uh, just use a prime example i i was heavily involved on the channel tunnel project the channel tunnel didn't build itself. It started off as an idea mm. in thought. Then that idea manifests at the next level in terms of a plan, um, diagrams, calculations. Mm. But that's not enough. We have to go to the next level down and have a project management structure. But that's not enough. We have to have workers to dig the tunnel and build it. So everything is the manifestation of thought. Thought made flesh. Thought enfleshed. Thought materialized. Mm. But thought materialized, the essence is still thought. Sure. So um, in the in the simplest terms, if you take any company. You have the uh, chief executive, you have the management, and you have the workers. The, the chief executive 
lays down the vision. The vision is taken on board by the project managers. And that has to be translated down to the workforce. If the workforce didn't have a mission and a vision, they'd just be making rubbish. So here you have a, a crude metaphor for spirit, soul, and body. You have the project management, the soul equivalent, the interface touching at the highest level, the chief executive, and at the lowest level, the workforce. And lowest, I'm not trying to sound uh, in a degrading sense, I mean only in terms of uh, direction. The chief executive can't get down to the factory floor to do things, that's not his job. Equally, the people who are doing the job on the factory floor have no idea of the vision until it comes from the chief executive. But what they are doing on the factory floor is still thought using material. Thanks. This is, I think, why uh, Aristotle explained uh, in order to have a proper comprehensive knowledge of any aspect of reality, you need to consider the four aspects of cause. The final cause. Yes. The, the, the yeah. teleological final cause. And, and actually, the rest of the causes are directed by that final cause, yeah, by that that's final right. Yes. The final the cause is, yeah. is the primary, and the rest are the tributaries, yes. so to speak. The material cause, the efficient cause, the formative cause. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they all they all follow suit, and, and actually, uh, one point that uh, Sri Pad Bhaktimadava Puri Maharaj makes in this book is what mm -hmm. Francis Bacon did. He very uh, explicitly uh, saw these four causes and said, "There's no need for formative cause and final cause. All we need to worry about is material and efficient cause." And so, this is one of the historical uh, decisions that directed what became our modern materialistic science. They don't yeah. think about formal or final cause at all. Yeah, um, I'm not going to argue about this, uh, Krishna, but I belong to the Francis Bacon Society, and that's not my reason for, for responding. But huh. I think a lot of Bacon's esoteric ideas have been downplayed a lot. And... Um, Bacon has been sort of uh, credited with this age of modern science and materialism. And again, it is my feeling, and I can't back this up with quoted evidence, that again, Bacon was only talking of one aspect. Whereas as with Newton, as with Newton, Bacon's higher thinking has probably not been given full credit. But I can't, um, I, I can't really um, be more forceful than that, because I've not researched it in the way that I have thoroughly researched Newton's uh, uh, esoteric writings. But certainly, uh, it was uh, William Blake, I think, who said, who referred to Bacon, John Locke and Newton as the infernal trio. Well, you can't quite blame William Blake, because in his day, there was no access to Newton's esoteric writings. They were in a big trunk belonging to the Portsmouth family, and the, the, the esoteric writings have only surfaced in the 1930s when they were auctioned at Sotheby. So understandably, Bacon has, it carries this charge. But maybe Bacon's um, deeper understanding would be otherwise. And I will check this. I will check this if you're interested with the Bacon Society, because there are some really good scholars. And I will do that for you. It's very important to establish the truth. There is there's a, a few points, and I would have to also maybe do further research, but I have read in uh, his is the the Magno uh, one of his works Francis Bacon's works the Magno Stratum or something like that right but he yeah. he says this De Solipsis 
de silipsis imum. I, I'm probably butchering the Latin, but basically of ourselves, we say nothing. Mm. He, and, and I read this directly from one of his works, although I haven't gone much deeper into it. But mm. so he seemed to um, promote this idea that the effect that the scientist has on the observation should not be mentioned in science, that the role of the observer should mm. not be analyzed. That so this is another one of those things where it from the, from maybe a uh, not so informed perspective or but it seems kind of straightforward in this one piece that I read where he is he was promoting that the science the role of the observer the role of the scientist should not be included in in science itself mm -hmm. and, and what science is looking at and that seems to be a little bit misled misleading to me and that the role of the observer is a, an absolutely essential part of a holistic science. There, there are two very important uh, points that you mentioned, uh, Krishna. First, classical science, of course, kept the uh, observer separated from the observation. But it was John Wheeler, uh, I think, uh, the Dean of Engineering at Princeton, uh, no less, or certainly in the Faculty of Engineering, the uh, John Wheeler, the great quantum physicist, who said, we can no longer, as a result of quantum physics experiments, we can no longer regard the experiment in terms of detached observation behind a thick glass wall. Mm. Participation, participation is the new word in science. Certainly. But then Wheeler did not have the courage to take this further. And he said, it is so sad to see this. Wheeler said, and here I do quote, but to take this further would be carrying too much of a load of metaphysical baggage. It's not metaphysical baggage. It's deep metaphysics to show that observer and observer are always linked. Yes. So um, I use the crude example that, well, but we need both. We need both. If I want to understand my neighbor purely as a scientist, then I drag him into my house. I cut him up in bits and pieces. I weigh him. I examine his organs and bodily parts. That's it. But I'm not understanding the person. I'm understanding the body. Yes. If I want to understand the person, I have to interact with him. I've got to have tea with him. I've got to take him out for dinner. So participation. Both have their uses. If there is a problem with the physical body, well, we treat the body as a material object. But that is only half the story, if, if that. The greatest scientists have said that in their moments of real illumination, they were in union with that which they were researching. Barbara McClintock, uh, who got the Nobel Prize for Physiology, yes. said she literally became in consciousness the, the, the cells and whatever she was researching. Einstein felt gravity in his bones. Newton became light. He wasn't looking at light. He became light in union. So participation is absolutely vital. And the big difference between the scientific and the mystic approach is the mystic understands through participation, the scientist through detachment. Therefore, therefore, the scientist researches he has to research further developments. The spiritual seeker, there's nothing to research. It's all there. He has to search to seek it out by being in union with that which he wishes to discover. Now, Hegel makes this distinction between three 
um, three, you know, this is different from his phenomenology of spirit, um, mm -hmm. but he makes the distinction between these three different perspectives of consciousness, I guess you would say. Mm -hmm. So we have the objective, the subjective, and the absolute, mm -hmm. where um, objective, uh, subjective consciousness refers to where everyone can think that they have their own personal perspective mm -hmm. of the reality and and that even if they are different perspectives everyone you know is is right so mm -hmm. even and we see this even in you know modern spiritual practices uh, mm -hmm. in a more broad way or not specific not specifically speaking about any particular spiritual tradition but people who kind of just subscribe to you know so-called spirituality in a very broad and vague way mm. that everyone mm. can have their own unique experiences and idea of reality period end of statement that's okay there is no absolute mm. to come into an accord with to some extent and and now we be very we're very careful about how we're trying to say this not not that there's any um on the finite scale, any kind of totalitarian uh, agenda or yeah, yeah. claiming to the absolute, but the concept of the absolute itself, uh, the concept of the infinite, which is what Spinoza called as um, cause of sui, right? The cause of itself, that which is only dependent upon itself, unlike yeah, us, which yeah. are dependent on other exactly. than ourselves. The, the first fundamental proposition in the poem of Blavatsky's great secret doctrine is a universal principle which cannot be attained through thought which is beyond the range and reach of thought but wouldn't wouldn't you say that the infinite has the ability to reveal itself of course it so, does so yeah, at, as much as thought, but uh, but ordinary thinking and rationalization yes will only take you so far Sure, from our side, from the finite side. Yes, but of but, course it reveals itself. Yeah, and, and that's where you have thought, the though. the symbol of the circle, and then the circle with the point in the middle. The focus. Yes, the. So to the to the extent that all of the finite experiences are a part of the infinite itself yes so the infinite can use any of those finite modes mm. as as a as a means of revelation we can yeah. say yeah so that's why the, the distinction between the finite approaching the infinite which is not possible as we said any finite rational approach mm. nothing you can't do it because that's what the finite means the finite cannot reach to the infinite by its own power yeah. it's limited but the infinite which encompasses everything, yes. encompasses all experience that we have here in this finite experience, mm -hmm. but it encompasses it and possesses it in its most full form, in its most mm -hmm. full form, mm -hmm. necessarily. Otherwise, we couldn't experience it if it wasn't there in the context in which we're participating. Yeah, absolutely, uh, yes. They're all, they, they can, they're all uh, modes of, of the absolute revealing itself to its constituents in order that they may uh, develop their consciousness and, and awaken to mm -hmm. that reality of which they are always a part mm -hmm. and then and then you now use their freedom to engage in that in a very conscious way instead of mm -hmm. being self-serving being absolute serving mm -hmm. yes um using the self to serve the not self or the absolute and again i come back to my theme that the great minds say the same things in their different ways. Einstein pointed out the difference between what is true and what is really true. And he said that what is true is that which uh, appears to our physical senses and what we perceive with our senses. And that's all that science can discover. But what is really true, really true, is only accessible to what he called the universal observer. Well, the universal observer is the universal consciousness. He, or that, which has total vision. 
So there is relative truth and absolute truth. And um, in this book, actually, um, by a wonderful Jane professor, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but anyway, he, he gives a very good example of that, that if um, we all know, um, if you have a charged electrical sphere, it only has an electrical field. And if you move it, then you have the electromagnetic field and, you know, and hence we have electricity and all of that. But if an observer on a planet outside Earth, obviously, were to observe that charged electrical sphere, which is static on Earth, he would not see it as static. For him, it would be moving. So does that charged electric sphere have an electromagnetic field or doesn't it? And the answer is, the answer is, it is unanswerable because the truth of that only is known to the universal observer. You've mentioned Hegel a lot. Are you concentrating on uh, Hegel at the moment in the uh, Bhaktivedanta Institute uh, on his writings? Well, our institute specifically uh, in Princeton focuses on uh, Hegelian philosophy and the right. Bhagavad Vedanta philosophy because yeah. of their the dialectic approach. Yeah. This mm -hmm. dialectic approach, which we've been emphasizing with, you know, the phrases unity, indifference, mm -hmm. or um, unity and diversity, identity and difference, how mm -hmm. considering mm -hmm. the whole requires this dialectic approach rather than either a non-dual non -dual approach or a dual approach. Most yeah, yeah. individuals seem to get stuck in that Dichotomy, in that dichotomy. dichotomy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's e either of those is abstract. You know, yeah. so many non dualists will either say one of two things either one is materialism, so it's all reducible to atoms, or on the other end of the spectrum, yeah. it's all reducible to impersonal consciousness. Without so, seeing the dynamic between the two, without seeing the it's fact the spark, that the spark it, that flies between those two. Well, the, the, the differentiation, yeah. because even yeah. when when people say that the, the truth is a non-dual, mm. uh, imp impersonal consciousness, I mean, mm. that's just a very completely abstract conception. Consciousness necessarily means subject-object and subject-object relation. That's yeah. what consciousness refers to. Yeah. And now, whether that's uh, on a relative scale, which is not what it's limited to mm. the subject object relation uh, is also on an absolute scale mm. between what we call infinite spirit or god and finite mm. spirit or the the souls yeah. you know who take embodiments in many embodiments different organisms. of the infinite potential in their sphere of manifestation yes but uh, in the vedantic view they're they're necessarily part and parcel of the infinite. So yeah. it's, it's, it's called the chintya beta abeda tattva. This yeah. is the dialectic principle as described in the Vedantic side, mm -hmm. where it's simultaneously, the, the finite is simultaneously one with and different from the right. infinite. So the difference has to be there, but it's for the purpose of the whole. And many times there's several examples given to kind of give a clear description of that. With the sun, you have the sun orb, and then the sun rays emanate from that sun. Mm. So when we look outside or we look inside the room we're in and it's illuminated by the light, it would be ridiculous to say that the entire sun is in the room. Yeah, exactly. Only, <laughs> only, only particles of the sun are in the room, only its yeah. energy is. Yeah. So similarly, the living entities in but their constitutional the, position mm. are the energy the shakti mm. the shakti mom is the sun orb the the yeah. origin of the energy yeah. and the, the example is also given of the body uh, about how to how to depict the, the unity in diversity well mm. it's one it's one body yes. but 
but it's so many different parts, right? The hand is not the foot, the foot is not the heart, the heart is not the head. Mm. Yet when you say the body, you mean all of them, and, and the correctly body so. Is a collective term, it's a generalizing term for a whole host of intelligences working in harmony. But not only in harmony, but that th there is a whole which is greater than any of the differences. Like there is what Kant what Kant called the the unity of apperception, right? The yeah. the differentiation that's there, the self, the I, mm. is a singular experience. Mm. But that singular experience is constitu it's constitutive of this diversity of things. The yes. different cells with different in the different cells have different individual consciousnesses serving different individual purposes on mm -hmm. on a particular scale but on on the greater scale it's all serving the purposes of a singular self an eye so of it's the this, eye. yeah yeah so it's it's very it's a very like we said dynamic use the term apperception I, uh, and so did leibniz as well i think uh, uh -huh. yeah yeah those very important points about like uh, th this unity of the differences, because you know many people say, you know, how, how do you know the soul is there? What is the soul? Uh, <laughs> the soul is is the concept which unifies all that content, the, that unity of apperception when we perceive whiteness or cubeness or sweetness, all these mm. different things, but we know mm. it as one thing, a sugar cube. Mm. What is unifying that differentiated? content of the senses that is a, a self a soul mm -hmm. similarly in bhagavad gita the example is given uh, just like we move from different bodies in this lifetime from youth to adolescent to old age similarly we move to another body at birth it's exactly. pointing out something very fundamental yes. it's pointing yes. out that there is a there's an unchanging underlying the changing, although we're going from a whole different body from youth. You look at a picture of a, a five-year-old and a, the same yeah. person at 25 and the same person at 75, completely different bodies. And science even tells us that 99% of the body on a cellular level but is completely still something new. that is unchanged. Yeah, and that's the main part, the yeah. self, that it is exactly. I, it's one person. Yeah. <laughs> It is the unchanged that is expressing itself through change. Yes. And in order to express through change, you have to express through material corresponding to that expression. So you express through the youthful body, the old age body, and the baby body. <laughs> yes. So one of the I guess the takeaways what we're trying to present when we talk to scientists or talk to individuals who are not so much subscribing to these ideas, even though they're very reasonable and they seem necessary, mm. is back to that metaphysical question you were mentioning before, how it's, you have to deal with the metaphysics. You can't just ignore it as... No, of course not. <laughs> so so it, what is that metaphysics? It's what it starts from. It's what it starts from, exactly, of course. It's what are the underlying presumptions? Presumptions. Yes. Presuppositions. Can't, presuppositions that we can't ignore, but but it's not a bad thing. I think one of the, the it, it sounds like a taboo subject for some uh, scientists because they don't want to admit that there has to be metaphysical position before you can say anything. They, they'd Blav rather say. Blavatsky put it beautifully. Yeah. Science is honeycombed. No, she said physics. Physics is honeycombed in metaphysics. Must that be. really is a such a beautiful short way of saying physics is honeycombed, like honey in a comb, in metaphysics. You cannot get away from the honeycomb. Yeah. <laughs> That's where your honey is. If there and were how? no honeycomb, there would be no honey. <laughs> And then the question becomes how to then work that into education, how to actually yes, yes. how to actually implement that in education, you know, because it's as you as we've said, so many so many different people have come to this you know conclusion that metaphysics is underlying the whole thing. But so then how to point out the necessity of that metaphysics and not only the necessity of metaphysics in general, mm. but 
you know, have some rational conclusion, what is that metaphysics? Because so many people will say it's dualistic. No, it's non-dual. And they go back, fight back and forth throughout yeah. the history of philosophy. That's why we're trying to emphasize this dialectic metaphysics. It, we yeah. can't keep going back and forth between some non-dual or some dualism. It's it's a craziness. Yeah. <laughs> The, the, the problem there, Krishna, is some minds can only operate yeah. in dichotomies. So the, that's the problem you have. And I think, again, this Einstein, I, I only mention him because, you know, if you mention a scientist, people take him more seriously. If you mention a poet or a musician, they don't, even though poets and musicians have much more to say very often. But one of the things Einstein said, or is attributed to him, that to see the truth in apparently diverging points of view is the mark of a man who attains to truth. So these apparently diverging points of view, there are sparks that fly across them, like poles, let's say, like electrical poles. And to see the truth, is to see the spark flying between these two positions rather than get fixated on one pole or the other. Subject, yeah, the object, activity. and their relation. Yes, the activity. The activity, process, process, yeah. Great. So, um, I, you know, as we close here, um, do you have any other concluding words for us, Mr. Bellamoria? Oh, gosh. <laughs> One can say so much, Krishna, but I think we need to point out that the soul of man, and I use man, of course, in the sense of the thinker, not gender, you know, man from manas, men's, to think. The soul of man is a thing whose splendor and growth has no limits. And the only limits we put on it are self-made. And of course, when I say a thing, it's not an object. It's, it's an organic being. So our growth and potential is infinite, not all in this life, of course. But the, the other point, uh, directing it to science, is something that the great, uh, I was just rereading his um, Yogananda, uh, pointed out that science has discovered the secrets of the atom, the secrets of the material nature. The secret, they've gone out into space. What science has got to do now is to discover the secret of themselves. Yes. The inner space, because if they don't, the outer discoveries will just result in our destruction. So the only bomb-proof shelter against nuclear bombs, the only real bomb-proof shelter against nuclear bombs, is the scientist understanding his own mind to That's make the inner journey. And as the great Paul Brunton, the great sage said, we need to mentalize space and to spatialize mind. So Mr. Scientist, you've done enough going to Mars and outer planets and secrets of the atom, great. Now discover the secret of your own mind. Since this is a very uh, perfect way to conclude, I think. Um, since 2013, um, Sripad Bhakti Madhava Puri Maharaj had, uh, with the help of other devotee scientists like Srila Bhakti Niskam Shanta Maharaj, have uh, started a conference series that's uh, an international conference series that's gone on in Nepal and in India in 2019. It came here to Rutgers University in the US, and mm -hmm. during COVID, it was online. And it's called Science and Scientist. Mm. Science, uh, the scientist can explain science, but science can't explain the scientist. 
So indeed the scientist, <laughs> indeed not. The scientist needs and to you consider know, himself. The scientist has given everything we can have, but it has not tell us, told us what we can live for. Ah, In science, yes. we can live to have whatever we want within reason. But science now needs to tell us what to live for. I agree, yes. Not what to live to possess. Yes. Um, so, Mr. Billy Mori, I'm going to close the live stream. You. Do you mind if I ask you a couple of um, two specific questions after we close? Would yeah, of course. Okay? Yes, yes, by all means. Yeah. And let me say it's been a real privilege sharing uh, this conversation and really to be with with a resonant soul, if I can only put it that way, someone with whom one is in resonance, it, it is a great privilege because it does not happen just like that for the asking. We sincerely you appreciate you. No, we sincerely you appreciate much. your association. Thank you. Thank you very much.